Chapter Twenty Six of Ruth. This is a LibriVox recording. All LibriVox recordings are in the public domain. For more information or to volunteer, please visit LibriVox.org. Recording by Cynthia Lyons. Ruth by Elizabeth Cleghorn Gaskell. Chapter Twenty Six. Mr. Bradshaw's Virtuous Indignation. So it was that Jemima no longer avoided Ruth, nor manifested by word or look the dislike which for a long time she had been scarce concealing. Ruth could not help noticing that Jemima always sought to be in her presence while she was at Mr. Bradshaw's house, either when daily teaching Mary and Elizabeth, or when she came as an occasional visitor with Mr. and Miss Benson, or by herself. Up to this time Jemima had used no gentle skill to conceal the abruptness with which she would leave the room rather than that Ruth and she should be brought into contact, rather than that it should fall to her lot to entertain Ruth during any part of the evening. It was months since Jemima had left off sitting in the schoolroom as had been her wont during the first few years of Ruth's governessship. Now, each morning, Miss Bradshaw seated herself at a little round table in the window, at her work or at her writing, but whether she sewed or wrote or read, Ruth felt that she was always watching, watching. At first Ruth had welcomed all these changes in habit and behavior, as giving her a chance, she thought, by some patient waiting or some opportune show of enduring constant love to regain her lost friend's regard. But by and by the icy chillness, immovable and gray, struck more to her heart than many sudden words of unkindness could have done. They might be attributed to the hot impulses of a hasty temper, to the vehement anger of an accuser, but this measured manner was the conscious result of some deep-seated feeling. This cold sternness befitted the calm implacability of some severe judge. The watching, which Ruth felt was ever upon her, made her unconsciously shiver as you would if you saw that the passionless eyes of the dead were visibly gazing upon you. Her very being shriveled and parched up in Jemima's presence, as if blown upon by a bitter, keen east wind. Jemima bent every power she possessed upon the one object of ascertaining what Ruth really was. Sometimes the strain was very painful. The constant tension made her soul weary, and she moaned aloud, and upbraided circumstance. She dared not go higher to the maker of circumstance, for having deprived her of her unsuspicious, happy ignorance. Things were in this state when Mr. Richard Bradshaw came on his annual home visit. He was to remain another year in London and then to return and be admitted into the firm. After he had been a week at home, he grew tired of the monotonous regularity of his father's household, and began to complain of it to Jemima. "'I wish Farquhar were at home. Though he is such a stiff, quiet old fellow, his coming in the evening makes a change. What has become of the Millses? They used to drink tea with us sometimes, formerly.' Oh, papa and Mr. Mills took opposite sides at the election, and we have never visited since. I don't think they are any great loss. Anybody is a loss. The stupidest bore that ever was would be a blessing if he only would come in sometimes. Mr. and Miss Benson have drunk tea here twice since you came. Come, that's capital. Apropos of stupid bores, you talk of the Bensons. I did not think you had so much discrimination, my little sister. Jemima looked up in surprise, and then reddened angrily. I never meant to say a word against Mr. or Miss Benson, 
and that you know quite well, Dick. Never mind. I won't tell tales. They are stupid old fogies, but they are better than nobody, especially as that handsome governess of the girls always comes with them to be looked at. There was a little pause. Richard broke it by saying, Do you know, Mimi, I've a notion, if she plays her cards well, she may hook Farquhar. Who? asked Jemima shortly, though she knew quite well. Mrs. Denby, to be sure. We were talking of her, you know. Farquhar asked me to dine with him at his hotel as he passed through town, and I'd my own reasons for going and trying to creep up his sleeve. I wanted him to tip me, as he used to do. For shame, Dick, burst in Jemima. Well, well, not tip me exactly, but lend me some money. The governor keeps me deucedly short. Why, it was only yesterday, when my father was speaking about your expenses and your allowance, I heard you say that you'd more than you knew how to spend. Don't you see that was the perfection of art? If my father had thought me extravagant, he would have kept me in with a tight rein. As it is, I'm in great hope of a handsome addition, and I can tell you it's needed. If my father had given me what I ought to have had at first, I should not have been driven to the speculations and messes I've gotten into. What speculations? What messes? asked Jemima, with anxious eagerness. Oh, messes was not the right word. Speculations hardly was, for they are sure to turn out well, and then I shall surprise my father with my riches. He saw that he had gone a little too far in his confidence, and was trying to draw in. But what do you mean? Do explain it to me. Never you trouble your head about my business, my dear. Women can't understand the share market and such things. Don't think I've forgotten the awful blunders you made when you tried to read the state of the money market aloud to my father that night when he had lost his spectacles. What were we talking of? Oh, oh, a Farquhar and pretty Mrs. Denby. Yes, I soon found out that was the subject my gentleman liked me to dwell on. He did not talk about her much himself, but his eyes sparkled when I told him what enthusiastic letters Polly and Elizabeth wrote about her. How old do you think she is? I know said Jemima. At least I heard her age spoken about, amongst other things, when first she came. She will be five-and-twenty this autumn. And Farquhar is forty, if he is a day. She's young, too, to have such a boy as Leonard, younger-looking, or full as young-looking as she is. I tell you what, Mimi, she looks younger than you. How old are you? Three-and-twenty, ain't it? last march replied jemima you'll have to make haste and pick up somebody if you're losing your good looks at this rate why jemima i thought you had a good chance of farquhar a year or two ago how come you have lost him i'd far rather you'd had him than that proud haughty mrs denby who flashes her great grey eyes upon me if ever i dare pay her a compliment she ought to think it an honour that I take that much notice of her. Besides, Farquhar is rich, and it's keeping the business of the firm in one's own family, and if he marries Mrs. Denby, she will be sure to be wanting Leonard in when he's of age, and I won't have that. Have a try for Farquhar, Mimi. Ten to one it's not too late. I wish I'd brought you a pink bonnet down. You go about so dowdy, so careless of how you look. If Mr. Farquhar has not liked me as I am, said Jemima, choking, I don't want to owe him to a pink bonnet. Nonsense! I don't like to have my sister's governess stealing a march on my sister. I tell you, Farquhar is worth trying for. If you'll wear the pink bonnet, I'll give it to you, and I'll back you against Mrs. Denby. I think you might have done something with our member, as my father calls him, when you had him so long in the house. But altogether, I should like Farquhar best for a brother-in-law. By the way, have you heard down here that Dunn is going to be married? 
I heard of it in town, just before I left, from a man that was good authority. Some Sir Thomas Campbell's seventh daughter, a girl without a penny, father ruined himself by gambling and obliged to live abroad. But Dunn is not a man to care for any obstacle, from all accounts, when once he has taken a fancy. It was love at first sight, they say. I believe he did not know of her existence a month ago. No, we have not heard it, replied Jemima. My father will like to know. Tell it him, continued she, as she was leaving the room to be alone, in order to still her habitual agitation whenever she heard Mr. Farquhar and Ruth coupled together. Mr. Farquhar came home the day before Richard Bradshaw left for town. He dropped in after tea at the Bradshaws. He was evidently disappointed to see none but the family there, and looked round whenever the door opened. "'Look, look,' said Dick to his sister. "'I wanted to make sure of his coming in to-night, to save me my father's parting exhortations against the temptations of the world, as if I did not know much more of the world than he does. So I used a spell I thought would prove efficacious. I told him that we should be by ourselves, with the exception of Mrs. Denby, and look how he is expecting her to come in. Jemima did see, did understand. She understood, too, why certain packets were put carefully on one side, apart from the rest of the purchases of Swiss toys and jewellery, by which Mr. Farquhar proved that none of Mr. Bradshaw's family had been forgotten by him during his absence. Before the end of the evening she was very conscious that her sore heart had not forgotten how to be jealous. Her brother did not allow a word, a look, or an incident which might be supposed on Mr. Farquhar's side to refer to Ruth to pass unnoticed. He pointed out all to his sister, never dreaming of the torture he was inflicting only anxious to prove his own extreme penetration. At length Jemima could stand it no longer and left the room. She went into the schoolroom, where the shutters were not closed, as it only looked into the garden. She opened the window to let the cool night air blow in on her hot cheeks. The clouds were hurrying over the moon's face in a tempestuous and unstable manner making all things seem unreal, now clear out in its bright light, now trembling and quivering in shadow. The pain at her heart seemed to make Jemima's brain grow dull. She laid her head on her arms, which rested on the window-sill, and grew dizzy with the sick, weary notion that the earth was wandering lawless and aimless through the heavens, where all seemed one tossed and whirling rack of clouds. It was a waking nightmare, from the uneasy heaviness of which she was thankful to be roused by Dick's entrance. "'What? You are here, are you? I have been looking everywhere for you. I wanted to ask you if you have any spare money you could lend me for a few weeks.' "'How much do you want?' asked Jemima in a dull, hopeless voice. Oh, the more the better, but I should be glad of any trifle. I am kept so confoundedly short. When Jemima returned with her little store, even her careless, selfish brother was struck by the wanness of her face, lighted by the bed-candle she carried. Come, Mimi, don't give it up. If I were you, I would have a good try against Mrs. Denby. I'll send you the bonnet as soon as ever I get back to town, and you pluck up a spirit, and I'll back you against her even yet. It seemed to Jemima strange, and yet only a fitting part of this strange, chaotic world, to find that her brother, who was the last person to whom she could have given her confidence in her own family, and almost the last person of her acquaintance to whom she could look for real help and sympathy should have been the only one to hit upon the secret of her love, and the idea 
passed away from his mind as quickly as all ideas not bearing upon his own self-interests did. The night, the sleepless night, was so crowded and haunted by the miserable images that she longed for day, and when day came, with its stinging realities, she wearied and grew sick for the solitude of night. For the next week she seemed to see and hear nothing but what confirmed the idea of Mr. Farquhar's decided attachment to Ruth. Even her mother spoke of it as a thing which was impending, and which she wondered how Mr. Bradshaw would like, for his approval or disapproval was the standard by which she measured all things. "'O oh, merciful God!' prayed Jemima, in the dead silence of the night. The strain is too great. I cannot bear it longer. My life, my love, the very essence of me, which is myself through time and eternity, and on the other side there is all-pitying charity. If she had not been what she is, if she had shown any sign of triumph, any knowledge of her prize, if she had made any effort to gain his dear heart, I must have given way long ago and taunted her, even if I did not tell others, taunted her even though I sank down to the pit the next moment. The temptation is too strong for me. O oh Lord, where is thy peace that I believed in, in my childhood, that I hear people speaking of now as if it hushed up the troubles of life and had not to be sought for, sought for? as with tears of blood. There was no sound nor answer to this wild imploring cry which Jemima half thought must force out a sign from heaven. But there was a dawn stealing on through the darkness of her night. It was glorious weather for the end of August. The nights were full of light as the days everywhere save in the low dusky meadows by the riverside where the mists rose and blended the pale sky with the lands below. Unknowing of the care and trouble around them, Mary and Elizabeth exulted in the weather, and saw some new glory in every touch of the year's decay. They were clamorous for an expedition to the hills, before the calm stillness of the autumn should be disturbed by storms. They gained permission to go on the next Wednesday, the next half-holiday. They had won their mother over to consent to a full holiday, but their father would not hear of it. Mr. Bradshaw had proposed an early dinner, but the idea was scouted out by the girls. What would the expedition be worth if they did not carry their dinners with them in baskets? Anything out of a basket, and eaten in the open air, was worth twenty times as much as the most sumptuous meal in the house. So the baskets were packed up, while Mrs. Bradshaw wailed over probable colds to be caught from sitting on the damp ground. Ruth and Leonard were to go. They four. Jemima had refused all invitations to make one of the party and yet she had a half-sympathy with her sister's joy, a sort of longing, lingering look back to the time when she too would have reveled in the prospect that lay before them. They too would grow up and suffer, though now they played, regardless of their doom. The morning was bright and glorious, just cloud enough, as some one said, to make the distant plain look beautiful from the hills, with its floating shadows passing over the golden cornfields. Leonard was to join them at twelve, when his lessons with Mr. Benson and the girls with their masters should be over. Ruth took off her bonnet and folded her shawl with her usual dainty, careful neatness, and laid them aside in a corner of the room to be in readiness. She tried to forget the pleasure she always anticipated from a long walk towards the hills while the morning's work went on, but she showed enough sympathy to make the girls cling round her with many a caress of joyous love. Everything was beautiful in their eyes, 
from the shadows of the quivering leaves on the wall to the glittering beads of dew not yet absorbed by the sun which decked the gossamer web in the vine outside the window eleven o'clock struck the latin master went away wondering much at the radiant faces of his pupils and thinking that it was only very young people who could take such pleasure in the delectus ruth said now let us try to be very steady this next hour and mary pulled back ruth's head and gave the pretty budding mouth a kiss they sat down to work while mrs denbigh read aloud a fresh sun gleam burst into the room and they looked at each other with glad anticipating eyes jemima came in ostensibly to seek for a book but really from that sort of restless weariness of any one place of or employment which had taken possession of her since mr farquhar's return she stood before the bookcase in the recess languidly passing over the titles in search of the one she wanted ruth's voice lost a tone or two of its peacefulness and her eyes looked more dim and anxious at jemima's presence she wondered in her heart if she dared to ask miss bradshaw to accompany them in their expedition eighteen months ago she would have urged it on her friend with soft loving entreaty now she was afraid even to propose it as a hard possibility everything she did or said was taken so wrongly seemed to add to the old dislike or the later stony contempt with which miss bradshaw had regarded her while they were in this way mr bradshaw came into the room his entrance his being at home at all this time was so unusual a thing that the reading was instantly stopped and all four involuntarily looked at him as if expecting some explanation of his unusual proceeding his face was almost purple with suppressed agitation mary and elizabeth leave the room don't stay to pack up your books leave the room i say he spoke with trembling anger and the frightened girls obeyed without a word a cloud passing over the sun cast a cold gloom into the room which was late so bright and beaming but by equalizing the light it took away the dark shadow from the place where jemima had been standing and her figure caught her father's eye leave the room jemima said he why father replied she in an opposition that was strange even to herself but which was prompted by the sullen passion which seethed below the stagnant surface of her life and which sought a vent in defiance she maintained her ground facing round upon her father and ruth ruth who had risen and stood trembling shaking a lightning fear having shown her the precipice on which she stood it was of no use no quiet innocent life no profound silence even to her own heart as to the past the old offence could never be drowned in the deep but thus when all was calm on the great broad sunny sea it rose to the surface and faced her with its unclosed eyes and its ghastly countenance the blood bubbled up to her brain and made such a sound there as of boiling waters that she did not hear the words which mr bradshaw first spoke indeed his speech was broken and disjointed by intense passion but she needed not to hear she knew as she rose up at first so she stood now numb and helpless when her ears heard again as if the sounds were drawing nearer and becoming more distinct from some faint vague distance of space mr bradshaw was saying if there be one sin i hate i utterly loathe more than all others it is wantonness it includes all other sins 
it is but of a piece that you should have come with your sickly, hypocritical face imposing upon us all. I trust Benson did not know of it, for his own sake I trust not. Before God, if he got you into my house on false pretenses, he shall find his charity at other men's expense shall cost him dear. You, the common talk of Eccleston for your profligacy. He was absolutely choked by his boiling indignation. Ruth stood speechless, motionless, her head drooped a little forward, her eyes were more than half veiled by the large, quivering lids, her arms hung down straight and heavy. At last she heaved the weight off her heart enough to say, in a faint, moaning voice, speaking with infinite difficulty, I was so young. The more depraved, the more disgusting you, Mr. Bradshaw exclaimed, almost glad that the woman, unresisting so long, should now begin to resist. But, to his surprise, for in his anger he had forgotten her presence, Jemima moved forwards and said, Father! You hold your tongue, Jemima. You have grown more and more insolent, more and more disobedient every day. I now know who to thank for it. When such a woman came into my family, there is no wonder at any corruption, any evil, any defilement. Father, not a word, if in your disobedience you choose to stay and hear what no modest young woman would put herself in the way of hearing, you shall be silent when I bid you. The only good you can gain is in the way of warning. Look at that woman." indicating Ruth, who moved her drooping head a little on one side, as if by such motion she could avert the pitiless pointing, her face growing whiter and whiter still every instant. Look at that woman, I say, corrupt, long before she was your age, hypocrite for years. If ever you or any child of mine cared for her, shake her off from you, as St. Paul shook off the viper even into the fire. He stopped for very want of breath. Jemima, all flushed and panting, went up and stood side by side with Juan Ruth. She took the cold, dead hand which hung next to her in her warm, convulsive grasp, and, holding it so tight that it was blue and discolored for days, she spoke out beyond all power of restraint from her father. Father, I will speak. I will not keep silence. I will bear witness to Ruth. I have hated her. So keenly may God forgive me. But you may know, from that, that my witness is true. I have hated her, and my hatred was only quenched into contempt. Not contempt now, dear Ruth, dear Ruth. This was spoken with infinite softness and tenderness, and in spite of her father's fierce eyes and passionate gesture. I heard what you have learnt now, father, weeks and weeks ago, a year it may be, all time of late has been so long, and I shuddered up from her and from her sin, and I might have spoken of it and told it there and then if I had not been afraid that it was from no good motive I should act in doing so, but to gain a way to the desire of my own jealous heart. Yes, father, to show you what a witness I am for Ruth, I will own that I was stabbed to the heart with jealousy. Someone, someone cared for Ruth that, oh, father, spare me saying all. Her face was double-dyed with crimson blushes, and she paused for one moment no more. I watched her, and I watched her with my wild beast eyes. If I had seen one paltering with duty, if I had witnessed one flickering shadow of untruth in word or action, if, more than all things, my woman's instinct had ever been conscious of the faintest speck of impurity in thought or word or look, my old hate would have flamed out with the flame of hell, my contempt would have turned to loathing disgust. Instead of my being full of pity, and the stirrings of new-awakened love, and most true respect, Father, I have borne my witness. 
and i will tell you how much your witness is worth said her father beginning low that his pent-up wrath might have room to swell out it only convinces me more and more how deep is the corruption this wanton has spread in my family she has come amongst us with her innocent seeming and spread her nets well and skilfully she has turned right into wrong and wrong into right and taught you all to be uncertain whether there be any such thing as vice in the world or whether it ought not to be looked upon as virtue she has led you to the brink of the deep pit ready for the first chance circumstance to push you in and i trusted i trusted her i welcomed her i have done very wrong murmured ruth but so low that perhaps he did not hear her for he went on lashing himself up i welcomed her i was duped into allowing her bastard i sicken at the thought of it at the mention of leonard ruth lifted up her eyes for the first time since the conversation began the pupils dilating as if she were just becoming aware of some new agony in store for her i have seen such a look of terror on a poor dumb animal's countenance and once or twice on human faces i pray i may never see it again on either jemima felt the hand she held in her strong grasp writhe itself free ruth spread her arms before her clasping and lacing her fingers together her head thrown a little back as if in intensest suffering mr bradshaw went on that very child and heir of shame to associate with my own innocent children i trust they are not contaminated i cannot bear it i cannot bear it were the words wrung out of ruth cannot bear it cannot bear it he repeated you must bear it madam do you suppose your child is to be exempt from the penalties of his birth do you suppose that he alone is to be saved from the upbraiding scoff do you suppose that he is ever to rank with other boys who are not stained and marked with sin from their birth every creature in eccleston may know what he is do you think they will spare him their scorn cannot bear it indeed before you went into your sin you should have thought whether you could bear the consequences or not have had some idea how far your offspring would be degraded and scouted till the best thing that could happen to him would be for him to be lost to all sense of shame dead to all knowledge of guilt for his mother's sake ruth spoke out she stood like a wild creature at bay past fear now i appeal to god against such a doom for my child i appeal to god to help me i am a mother and as such i cry to god for help for help to keep my boy in his pitying sight and to bring him up in his holy fear let the shame fall on me i have deserved it but he he is so innocent and good ruth had caught up her shawl and was tying on her bonnet with her trembling hands what if leonard was hearing of her shame from common report what would be the mysterious shock of the intelligence she must face him and see the look in his eyes before she knew whether he recoiled from her he might have his heart turned to hate her by their cruel jeers jemima stood by dumb and pitying her sorrow was past her power she helped in arranging the dress with one or two gentle touches which were hardly felt by ruth but which called out all mr bradshaw's ire afresh he absolutely took her by the shoulders and turned her by force out of the room in the hall and along the stairs her passionate woeful crying was heard the sound only concentrated mr bradshaw's anger on ruth he held the street door open wide and said between his teeth if ever you or your bastard darken this door again i will have you both turned out by the police 
he needed not have added this if he had seen Ruth's face. End of chapter 26